she refused to rest until all women could be heard. She fought against slavery. She became a leading crusader for women's suffrage and fought for women's right to vote. She is Susan B. Anthony, an American woman of achievement. The date was November 18th, 1872. The place, Rochester, New York. At the home of the well-known defender of women's rights, Susan B. Anthony, there came a knock on the front door that had been expected for two weeks. This is the room where Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting. In 1872, she voted for the President of the United States, even though it was against the law. She and her three sisters walked up to Main Street to the barber shop, which was the polling place, and voted. Thirteen days later, the U.S. Marshal came to the front door, and she had him come right into her front parlor, which was a very formal room. Now, he came in, but was very embarrassed because Susan B. Anthony was a very well-known person, and he had to arrest her. So, very shyly, he said, well, Miss Anthony, um, you're under arrest, and at your convenience, please go downtown. The arresting officer, E.J. Keeney, was not in his element. Hoodlums and gangsters were his usual targets. But now he was forced to serve a warrant on a 52-year-old woman with a national reputation. And what crime had she committed? In an age when women had no vote and few rights, Susan B. Anthony forced the issue by her act of civil disobedience. Susan B. Anthony would have no part of that. You can handcuff me and take me downtown right now if you think that I'm a common criminal and you should treat me as such. And uh, her crime was basically that she voted and she was a woman and it was against the law to vote if you were a woman. Susan B. Anthony had a clear motive for voting illegally and she had waited for the authorities to arrest her so she could make her point to the nation. As one of the founders of the movement to guarantee the vote for American women, Anthony had already devoted over 20 years to the mission. She was adamant in demanding equal rights for men and women, and if it meant facing a trial and a prison sentence, she would not be dissuaded. He didn't handcuff her, but he took her downtown, and they didn't have police cars in those days, so they took the streetcar. And uh, when she got on and was asked for her five-cent fare, she said, well, you can ask this gentleman for my fare. I'm traveling at the expense of the U.S. government. And she made sure that everyone on the streetcar knew that she was arrested for voting, even though she was a citizen of the United States. Susan B. Anthony believed fervently that the United States Constitution granted women the right to vote, and she was willing to go to any extreme to prove it. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution, ratified just four years before, stated that, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. The law was aimed at giving the vote to black men as well as white. But Anthony and her followers believed it also opened the door for American women. Susan B. Anthony, in fact, as part of this never giving up, never despairing, um, I think she was inspired by a higher moral law as she was for abolition, so she was for women's rights, uh, that there was some higher rule than what society accepted, what the government and politicians at that time um, accepted, and that this was higher than, literally, than the law. So in uh, 1872, she cast a vote. She marched in. Uh, to Rochester, New York, and put her ballot in the ballot box, even though women had no right to vote at this time, and she was arrested. Susan B. Anthony was indicted for her actions at the polls, 
And when the election commissioner asked her if she had any doubt of her right to vote, Anthony quickly said, Not a particle. Her trial was delayed for six months, and free on bail, Anthony set off on a series of well-attended lectures to tell the tale of her arrest and educate her audiences about the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. The rights that we have now are entirely due to the people who fought for them. Things don't happen automatically. They happen because we, we make them happen. So the idea that women of all races and men of color are counted as citizens and human beings is entirely due to the abolitionist movement against slavery and the uh, suffragist movement uh, for the rights of women of all races. So, you know, before that, it's really important to remember that it wasn't that long ago that women of all races and men of color were objects. They were owned like tables and chairs. They were not people, they were not citizens, they were not voters. It took 150 years of very deep struggle to, and bringing the country to a halt and a civil war and everything else, to gain a legal identity as human beings. For, for women of all races and men of color. During the course of her lifetime, she is involved in the abolitionist movement, she's involved in the temperance movement, and she um, is obviously playing a very pioneering role in the women's suffrage movement. And what's interesting about this is what I think Susan, a Susan B. Anthony does is really establish the distinct legitimacy of the women's movement. She clearly is one of the heroines that spoke uh, for, uh, for many women in ways that were incredibly convincing. And she spoke uh, for women across classes, which I think was very, uh, very important um, in that era. Susan B. Anthony's trial for voting in the 1872 election was, according to Anthony and her supporters, a mockery of justice. The judge had strong anti-feminist opinions and would not even let the jury vote on Anthony's guilt or innocence. The judge simply directed the jury to enter a guilty verdict. When Susan B. Anthony objected, he fined her $100. Anthony's retort to him was, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. I shall persistently continue to urge all women to the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. God and religion were major factors in Susan B. Anthony's development into one of America's most esteemed women and a leader in the causes of the abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, and the temperance movement. Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820 in Adams, Massachusetts. She was the second oldest of seven children, and she was raised as a Quaker. Susan's father, Daniel Anthony, was an ardent defender of freedoms. He encouraged Susan and her siblings to acquire first-rate educations, had them working in his cotton mills alongside other laborers, and was tolerant of social disobedience in the cause of human rights. And his Quaker religion fostered an even greater tolerance toward women. In the Quaker meeting house, men and women spoke equally, so Susan B. Anthony thought that's the way it was everywhere. Moreover, Quaker women were able to vote on church-related issues, so anyone raised in that faith found it natural that men and women held views on issues that affected their lives. Religion uh, was a very important force in early American history, uh, especially in the early 19th century. Women who were reborn Christians who were awakened religiously by the revivals were, used religion, were inspired by their religious belief. There was the belief that people could change the world and make the world perfect. But most women still had almost no voice in their own affairs. It was Anthony's religious upbringing that set her apart from the majority of 19th century women. Susan B. Anthony uh, did not come out of uh, an evangelical Christian tradition in the United States. She came out of a Quaker religious tradition, which was also had the potential of being radicalizing uh, for women and for others. Certainly her education was not the cause of her radical views. It was in the one-room schoolhouse that Susan B. Anthony attended in Massachusetts, where Susan B. Anthony first saw the limitations of being a young woman. 
she learned her adding and subtracting and approached her teacher. Wouldn't he please give her just a few practice problems in division? And she would learn them on her own. Well, he refused. He said, Susan, there is no reason that a woman will ever need to know division. I won't give you any problems. But she did excel and began to teach school herself in neighboring communities at the age of 16. When she was 17, Susan went to Philadelphia to study further at the Select Seminary for Females, a strict Quaker school that Susan was unhappy at, but where she learned more about social injustices. When her father's mill failed during a recession, Susan went to upstate New York and took up teaching again, as well as farming. Susan B. Anthony was able to help her family out by teaching in Kanajahari and sending money home to help support the family. It was in Kanajahari when she first got involved in her first reform movement, and that was temperance. She found, however, that in working for this movement, she had very little power to make change without having a political voice. Uh, Susan B. Anthony had started life as a school teacher because women from uh, farming families uh, and from small middle-class families had to work that these families could not support their their daughters in in, uh, in in leisure and she had worked as a teacher and become very concerned with the fact that women teachers made considerably less than men teachers. Susan B. Anthony took this very strongly and in fact quit the teaching profession because she was enraged at the discrimination against women and returned home, became active in temperance, and found again that as a temperance advocate, her advocacy rights were being curtailed because of her, uh, of her gender. Daniel Anthony also morally objected to the misuse of alcohol by men because he'd seen too many women abused by their drunken husbands. He preached abstinence, and Susan adopted his views. Susan B. Anthony became uh, converted to the temperance um, beliefs fairly early in her life, and I think even you know quite early, Susan B. Anthony went around speaking at temperance movements and urging people to give up the drinking of hard spirits, as they were called in the 19th century, and. Uh, she was really developed her speaking skills by going to temperance movements and speaking publicly. With money still very tight, Daniel Anthony moved his family to Rochester, New York in 1845 and took up farming. Susan taught for another three years at the prestigious Kanajahari Academy and then returned home. There, a new dimension was added to Susan's life, the talk of slavery, and its dire consequences for African Americans and for the country's future. Susan B. Anthony was introduced to the idea of reform by her family. In fact, it was at their farm home in Rochester, New York, where every Sunday there were anti-slavery meetings. And that's where she met reformers like Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Amy Post, and uh, that was a part of the Underground Railroad movement. Now, her parents were very active in the anti-slavery movement and always stood for what they believed in. The Underground Railroad was an informal network of abolitionists who secretly helped guide fugitive slaves from the South to safety in the North and in Canada. Susan was enraged by the injustice shown to blacks in the South and began to preach against slavery's abuses. Now, at the age of 29 and still unmarried, Susan B. Anthony was becoming deeply involved in two of the three great issues of her time. Throughout the 1850s, Susan B. Anthony's life revolved around two of the most pressing social issues of the day, abolition of slavery and abstinence from alcohol. During the decade that led to the Civil War, American voices became more heated, people took firm stands, and the fabric of the nation was beginning to unravel. Well, the abolitionist crusade was really sort of the great reform crusade of the early 19th century. And especially after the 1830s, when it sort of got this renewed vitality um, and energy from black abolitionists and also from white abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, who sort of brought this kind of evangelical zeal into the movement. And so in that sense, the abolitionist movement 
really was permeated by a lot of religious enthusiasm, a lot of evangelical enthusiasm. And for women, the abolitionist movement was an especially important reform crusade. Um, it not only drew them into this kind of public arena and a, this very political discussion about slavery, but it also, there were also very significant connections that were being made between abolition, abolitionist concerns and the abolitionist movement and the concerns that women had uh, for their own rights. And then I think for a number of women, they also began to make a connection between the way oppression was meted out to the slaves and the way women also suffered in 19th century American society. Ironically, it was Anthony's involvement in the temperance movement that initially opened her eyes to the real powerlessness of women and led her to devote most of her energies and her life to women's suffrage. Susan B. Anthony was working with men and women in New York State uh, for this cause, and when she went to the state convention, and she was asked to sit in a special spot with all the women. Well, Susan B. Anthony sat there, but then when she wanted to speak on the issue, she was told that the women, no, the sisters were there to learn and listen, but not to speak. Well, Susan B. Anthony stormed out, and she started the New York State Women's Temperance Society. This may have been the turning point of her life. By bolting from male-dominated organizations that restricted her speech, Susan B. Anthony now learned that she had a natural flair for public speaking and political organization. As the Temperance Society grew in prominence, she then began meeting other like-minded women. Soon after, when she was home, she, in Rochester, she found that her parents had attended the first Women's Rights Convention um, in 1848. It had been called in Seneca Falls, which was only about an hour away from Rochester, and the next month it was reconvened in Rochester. Her parents and her sister Mary attended, and they were full of the news of the convention, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott, and Lucy Stone, and all the wonderful women who were very intelligent and involved with this movement. Susan B. Anthony, through her temperance work, met Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1852. From that point on, she dove in, into the su women's suffrage movement and into the early women's rights movement and dedicated the rest of her life to it. The 1848 Seneca Falls Convention was the real beginning of the women's suffrage movement in America. And although Susan B. Anthony wasn't in attendance, she quickly became a major figure. Starting with 1850, uh, she devoted her energies to the women's movement which for a long time included as at its core abolition, criticism of slavery, and a concern with temperance. She, in those other two movements, she never became as visible or as outspoken a figure. She was sort of one of the women in the trenches in, in these battles, but she never assumed the leadership that she did in the women's movement. Um, the difference was that in the women's movement, she was both one of the executive leaders in terms of making decisions and calling meetings, etc., but she was also one of the leading writers. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became one of the most effective teams in the history of American politics. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had many children and was married and so on, uh, and constantly worked with Susan B. Anthony, who never married and had no children were essentially doing the same thing. And uh, certainly Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who rewrote the entire Bible in order to include women, was very far out as a married, nice married lady with children. And for the next 50 years, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony worked together ceaselessly to achieve the right for a woman to vote in America. Stanton and Anthony led the movement and complemented each other um, with the talents that they had. And Stanton very often did writing because she was limited by the number of children that she had. She had seven children. She did a lot of the writing and she was very, um, a very good politician. Susan B. Anthony did much of the traveling and speaking. She was a very good organizer and a public relations person. After a political firestorm over who would lead the temperance struggle, Stanton and Anthony resigned from their organization and turned their focus to a purely women's rights issue. At that time, 
The law in New York State declared that possessions and earnings of married women belong to the husband, declaring this a major injustice. Anthony and Stanton set out to change the law. There were many wrongs that Susan B. Anthony felt needed to be changed during her lifetime. For example, any woman who was married when Susan B. Anthony was a young girl had very few rights. Not only she didn't have the right to vote, she couldn't own property. If she worked outside the home, her wages were paid directly to her husband. She could not inherit property, own property, sue in court, or even have custody of her children. They lobbied the state legislature and traveled extensively through New York for seven frustrating years, but finally their determination paid off. In March of 1860, the legislature passed the Married Woman's Property Act, giving women control over their wages and other property. Susan B. Anthony had achieved a major victory for equality. Susan B. Anthony spent the years of the Civil War pressing for the two topics at the top of her agenda, abolition and women's rights. But it was clear that nothing could be determined until the final battle was fought and the future of the Union was secure. Anthony was convinced that the most equitable future was a country where universal suffrage was the law. That is, the right to vote for all adults, regardless of race or sex. So Anthony took to the road again to try to convince state legislatures that women's voting rights were crucial to democracy's success. Susan B. Anthony felt that there was no woman so situated that they, she couldn't do something for the movement. And um, this was part of Anthony's genius, was to um, create a network of women across the country and maintain connection with them. And in fact, as she traveled around the country and spoke, it was in their homes that she stayed. Anthony spent time in Kansas, Wyoming, and other western states, getting audiences ranging from a few dozen to the thousands. And after years of petitioning and pleading, her words were beginning to alter ancient habits. Susan B. Anthony's work as a leader and really considered the main leader of the suffrage association and of the whole suffrage movement uh, consisted of traveling and speaking, traveling the country and speaking so that she could change attitudes and in that way the laws would be able to be changed. She traveled the country at a time when traveling was very difficult. She was traveling in the Wild West by train when Jesse James was robbing them. She traveled by stagecoach, buggy, left off sometimes in what they called stations but they were like a shacks in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest. By 1868, Anthony and Stanton had control over the influential newspaper, The Revolution, which during its two-year life was the most vocal of the suffrage publications, calling for the reevaluation of the 14th and 15th Amendments because they did not specifically grant the vote to women and calling for equal pay for women in the workforce. At the same time, she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were forming the National Woman Suffrage Association, consisting of women from around the country. Its goal was the passage of a constitutional amendment granting women the right to vote. She was politically convinced um, of the rightness of her cause, and she felt that if she didn't do this, no one would do it, and the cause would die. The 1870s brought about a division in the nation's women's groups because one faction, led by Lucy Stone, who backed the 15th Amendment, wanted to go slowly toward suffrage, while Anthony and Stanton chose a more radical course. But while internal bickering continued, the real goal was not lost in the skirmishes. When Wyoming became the first territory to grant women the right to vote, supporters celebrated Anthony's victory on her 50th birthday. Susan B. Anthony never stopped fighting, even after years of losing battle after battle. Woman suffrage had been defeated by Congress, by the Supreme Court, by both major political parties, and by the male electorate. But nothing could defeat Susan B. Anthony. At this point, she realized that only the passage of a constitutional amendment, specifically granting women the right to vote, would achieve her goals. She vowed to fight on. After her arrest in Rochester for illegally voting in November 1872, Anthony stayed on the grueling lecture circuit to keep the issue in front of the public 
and she began writing with Stanton the first volume of the history of woman suffrage, which would be published to great acclaim in 1881. Susan B. Anthony appeared in front of every Congress from 1869 until 1906, the year she died. Susan B. Anthony was considered the leader of the movement so much that the amendment, giving women the right to vote, was named for her. In the last years of her life, Susan B. Anthony continued her hectic schedule, never wavering from her goal. She was now nationally famous, and her speeches drew large crowds of followers. In 1892, she was elected president of the new National American Woman Suffrage Association and kept the job until her 80th birthday in 1900. Susan B. Anthony died peacefully in her home in Rochester in 1906. And in 1920, 37 states ratified the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, finally giving women the right to vote. And in November of that year, women flocked to the ballots. Exactly 100 years after her birth, Susan B. Anthony's dream had been realized. Even though she never lived to see the law passed in 1920, we believe that she would have had great celebration. In fact, in her last public speech in Baltimore, just a month before she died, she urged the young suffragists to continue on with the fight and inspired them with her final public words, failure is impossible. Susan B. Anthony, an American woman of achievement. <laughs>